G'day, yes? All right, you said you would count down from 10, so that threw me off. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is obviously Matt Frad. Massive thank you to EWTN Vatican for allowing us to use their beautiful terrace uh, overlooking the Vatican. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Cameron Batuzzi, who many of you know. Uh, we've had debates together. We've been friends for several years. He's got a wonderful channel called Capturing Christianity, and he's decided to become Catholic. And so today, we're just going to break all that open and discuss it. A uh, couple of things before we begin. Uh, if you're not yet subscribed, do that. We're almost at 300,000 and looking forward to that. Uh, secondly, I know uh, that many people have questions, but uh, the only questions we're going to be taking are from local supporters. And it's going to be uh, during a live stream later on tonight. Me and Cameron are going to be in a different rooftop, really close to the Vatican, drinking what do you drink in Italy, apart from wine? What's a good liqueur? Uh, limoncello. Limoncello. And we'll do a, a special bonus live stream for our local supporters over there where we'll take your questions. So be sure to stick around to that. And then finally, I want to say a massive thank you to Catholic Woodworker for sponsoring this show. Catholic Woodworker makes beautiful home altars and the most beautiful rosaries I've ever come across. Uh, sometimes you'll get a rosary that's far too, uh, what do you say, uh, frail. You know, it breaks apart in your pocket. Others are so big, you could strangle someone with them, but uh, they're impractical. These are the most beautiful rosaries out there. There is a link in the description. If you click that link right now, you'll get 20% off any of the rosaries, any of the home altars that they sell. I know Jonathan, the fellow who runs it, a really wonderful Catholic guy, and he gave me this rosary to give to Cameron Batuzzi. Cameron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Do I do the... No. To... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, this is this is beautiful, and uh, I've been I've been needing one, so appreciate it. Good. Thank it's you. so lovely to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be. Actually, I think I'll keep this up here because the wind. Yeah. The wind is yeah, it's pretty bright crazy. and windy. And now, windy. listen. You're from Houston. Yes. And you were really a Protestant. Yes. Uh, so, true. how does Lakewood Church compare to St. Peter's? Would you say? Um, St. Peter's is a little bigger. Uh huh. Uh, what else? <laughs> what else? <laughs> well, I would hope it's more beautiful. <laughs> yes, it is uh, quite, quite more. Beautiful. What was your tour like today? So it, that was actually something we did. We we wrapped up, and the guy who took me on a tour, he's sitting right behind us. Uh, and is a Swiss of, guard. And he's a Swiss guard, and he took me up all the way to the top, which I didn't even know. If you, I don't know if you guys can zoom in. You probably can't, but the very top, there's like a little. When you say top, area. what do you mean top? The very, very top. Like the tippy top. The, not the tippy top, no. But right around the top, there's like it. It looks like a little like bars. Wow. Can you see it? Yes, there's, I do see there's it. There's people up there. That's amazing. That's where I went, and so I was able to see all of Rome from up there. Wow. And uh, it was we, we toured inside the St. Peter's Basilica, and then we went up to the like the little dome inside where you can see the letters and everything that are like ten feet tall, and then we went up to the very top, and mm. it was great. But yeah, no, uh, the the differences are, are vast. <laughs> between something like Lakewood Church and St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah. yeah. But is there like a, for Protestants, is there like a, a church that is like something that's... It know. probably is. Anyway. Maybe so. But uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this, is, this is fun. And a lot of people are so happy for you. I know many Catholics have been writing to me and writing in the comment section just saying they've been praying for you for so long and many of these people are converts from protestantism themselves yeah. they unlike myself understand how difficult it must be to convert much less if you have a successful youtube channel and many of your subscribers and viewers are protestants and who you love and um but it, that, that, that that takes courage how are you doing yeah um this has been, I, I think I told you last night, this has been one of the, the most difficult things I've ever had to do. And I think that, that does kind of like tell people a little about <laughs> the, the things that I've, the, the difficulty of my life. But um, it, it's been very difficult for, for me and for my family. And so I'm trying to be as sensitive to that as possible. And uh, let me also say as we start this is that I know that a lot of people are really excited about this and they're really excited to like send me, you know, congratulations, welcome home and, and this sort of thing. But I did want to ask at the beginning, everyone watching to please give some privacy to my wife. So don't send her messages. Don't don't send her 
uh, friend requests, just give us some privacy right now. That would be that would be huge. So, um, yeah, no, but it's been very difficult. Yeah, I bet. I can't imagine. You know, the only way I can think of it is, what if I became convinced by, let's say, James White or somebody, yeah. you see? Yeah. And then I, I'm running this YouTube channel called Pints with Aquinas. I mean, honestly, I, I, I want to go wherever the evidence leads, even yeah. if I'm uncomfortable with it, as you've said. But there's that kind of more superficial part of me that doesn't want pain, doesn't want discomfort. Yeah. What was that like for you? Yeah. Um, with capturing Christianity, it's a, it's a little bit different because what we started out doing and what we're going to continue doing is sort of theistic apologetics or like mere Christianity. Uh -huh. And so to me, I feel like you don't have to be Catholic or Protestant or you, you don't have to specifically be one of those in order to, to gain a huge benefit from supporting a, a channel like Capturing Christianity. And so the way that I view it is like that that wasn't really a, a deterrent for, for me to like embrace Catholicism because I, I feel like anyone who is a Christian can support the work that we do yeah. in defending mere Christianity, you know, so that it's, uh, you, you, you gave a, a great analogy years ago on your podcast that I heard where you, I mean, your goal is to get people to Catholicism, but in order to get an atheist to Catholicism, you have to start from where they are uh -huh. and move incrementally up to that point. And so I see capturing Christianity as a sort of base level where people can go yeah. from say atheism to Christianity. And then if they want to investigate further, then they can look at other resources. So uh, I hope that answers your question. No, I love that. Cause I mean, I remember you telling me that some of your intellectual heroes, maybe you discovered after the fact that they were in fact Catholic. Yeah. And maybe that caused yes. you to say, okay, well, maybe there's something to this Catholic thing, uh, even though they didn't necessarily wear it on their sleeve with every podcast or every talk. Well, eventually I came to learn that not only were there a lot of Catholics who were great philosophers, but that a lot of them were Protestants before and then embraced Catholicism later on after doing their own personal investigation. And that is very common. It's very common in the academic circle to go from Protestantism to Catholicism. I'm, I'm, I'm actually not aware of a single person who's gone from being a Catholic and being a philosopher to then embracing Protestantism based on some, some set of arguments. So, but, but there are many examples of Catholics who have done that. At what point in your Christian journey, because you're somewhat of a revert back to the Christian faith, aren't you, after the, you started the channel, I think, to investigate the, the claims of Christianity. Mm -hmm. At what point did Catholicism become a viable option for you? Or was it always that, but you just didn't know much about it? Um, that's a good question. And maybe it's a good way to kind of segue into some of the yeah. things that really opened me up. So what really opened me up was actually, so one of my objections to Catholicism for a while was divine simplicity. I can't remember where it is, but there is some dogma that says that you've basically got to believe divine simplicity right. in order to be Catholic. And I knew that, and I was like, okay, well, I don't accept that doctrine, and I, I, I can't even make sense of it. It doesn't even make sense to me. How can all of God's attributes be identical with each other? Like, that just doesn't make any sense to me at all. And so then there was this, uh, this new, he's a, Another example of a Protestant who became Catholic, Joshua Sidjuati. He, di he didn't do this on my channel. He did it on another channel. But he, uh, well, he, he actually wrote a paper on it. So that's, that's the, the genesis of where this came from. But then he went on to another channel. I don't know which one he went on. But he, he went on to talk about his, his new, uh, like, analysis or uh, view of a divine simplicity. And he, so he spelled out this new view based on trope theory. Okay which we're not going to get into that because Good. just the word itself is like enough to make <laughs> give me people, hot yeah, man. exactly <laughs> so he he's got this new theory of divine simplicity and when he spelled it out i was like okay okay that actually kind of like i can see that maybe being the case okay and so that was like the first light bulb that went on in my head where i was like Okay, so may, I might be able to actually like work through some of these issues. See, this is interesting because for many Protestants, they may come at this from a different angle. They may say the, the view, and I'm sure we'll get to this, the view Catholics have of the Blessed Virgin Mary or purgatory. But I suppose the fact that you were doing such a deep dive into arguments for God's existence mm -hmm. and what that means, 
it's interesting that that was your yeah. first kind of objection. Or yeah, that was my, because I've heard people talk about it, and then when I would hear someone spell it out, I, would, I was just like, uh, that doesn't make any sense to me. How, how can all of his properties be identical? And yeah, so it just, and then I learned later on that that was like, that was a sticking point for Catholicism. And I was like, okay, well then I definitely can't accept Catholicism if I can't accept this doctrine. Mm. And so that was, that was one of the sticking points for me. There were two, there were two others that I, I spent some time working through as well. One of them was the Eucharist, which you and I uh, had a debate about that. Yeah, that's and so online. I, People could check that out. I defended the metaphorical reading, which I don't think I hold that anymore, not because of some dogmatic claim from the Catholic Church. I just, as I was reading it one day again, I was like, coming back at it with this metaphorical reading in mind and I was like is that really the right reading of this passage I don't know anymore but that was that was one of the objections that I had was that if you read John 6 John 6 is the part where he says you've got to drink my blood you've got to eat my flesh in order to be saved it's very explicit yeah and Catholics will often point to that as like here's evidence of the Eucharist and so one of my objections was a it can be read more metaphorically and b it's not even a Last Supper narrative. The Last Supper narratives happen in the other Gospels. Mm -hmm. This one's in John. Excuse me, in John. And so it's not even a Last Supper narrative. What does this have to do with the Eucharist? And especially if it's metaphorical. But then I came to realize that you could actually take a metaphorical reading of John 6 and then consistently hold that the Eucharist is like the real body and, and blood. So you, could, you could hold transubstantiation and a metaphorical reading of John 6. So that was another barrier that was removed for me, is that I, I could see how, like, even if I took that view, could be the case that, you know, the, the, the Catholic teaching on this is, is also correct. Okay. So that was, one, that was uh, another, another big piece. And then the, uh, the third big piece, which I still am kind of working through, was uh, annihilationism. So this is a view about the end times or eschatology that says that in the end, the ungodly, the, the people that are apart from Christ, are going to be wiped out. They're going to be annihilated, destroyed. There's, there's no sort of such thing as uh, eternal conscious torment. And that was a view that I had held on the basis of listening to other uh, Protestant apologists like uh, Glenn Peoples, Chris Date. They've got great work on RethinkingHell.com. And uh, so I was like, I started to investigate this. And, and could annihilationism be consistent with Catholicism was one of the questions that I asked. And I did get a couple names of some Catholics who have been annihilationists. But I wasn't really satisfied with that. Uh, and then I listened to a debate with uh, an atheist on the topic of universalism. And he actually rattled off some really interesting arguments for universalism. Okay. And it, my, my journey as a Protestant had been sort of going in the direction of annihilationism toward universalism. I was, I was always at least what I, what I would call a hopeful universalist. So I was hopeful that everyone would be saved. Right. Sort of Bishop Robert Barron's view. Exactly. And so what, I, what I've come to recently is that hopeful universalism is more consistent with the Catholic understanding or, or just the traditional. It's, it's not, uh, uh, most Protestants are, uh, accept the traditional view as well, eternal conscious torment. Mm -hmm. But what I saw is that hopeful universalism seems to be a better fit on the traditional view as opposed to Annihilation. the annihilation. So if you had view. to choose one. Because so here's my hope. Here's my hope is that everyone that hell will eventually be emptied. That people will eventually come to see that this was it's silly to remain in sin. Yeah. So I don't think you can maintain that as a Catholic. Okay. Yeah. I think you can maintain a hopeful universalism as Baron does. I think Baron is yeah, see, within the realms of, of orthodoxy. Is. But to deny eternal conscious torment, I don't think is within the realms of all. What is his? Do you mind if I just ask? Well, I don't want to speak on behalf of the good bishop, but uh, he's not s making the claim that there is nobody in hell. Yeah. And he's no, no, not. No, that's not the claim either. I know. I just want to make sure I spell this okay, out well because okay, okay. I know Bishop Barron sometimes gets straw manned, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to say it as uh, accurately as I can. He's not making the claim. Uh, that there is no one in hell. He's not making the claim that everyone will be saved. But I think he says uh, we can at least hope for the salvation of all. Yes, and that's, that's what I think is, is more consistent. Because if, oh, so, so the idea, though, is that like, if everyone is just annihilated, there is no hope for everyone to, okay. to enter in. How, when, when did Sola Scriptura become a... Surely that's a... Sola Scriptura was never a, a sticking point for me. I eventually came to reject Sola Scriptura. But it wasn't like the, a linchpin or like 
something that really made me see the truth of Catholicism. So I never used that as an argument for, yeah. for Catholicism. But I, I eventually, I mean, it's relevant. I did eventually come to disagree with that view. Yeah. So I just didn't really see much reason to adopt it. And in the, the typical proof texts that are offered in favor of Sola Scriptura just didn't seem to do what they need to do to support that. And so just, per, you know, personally, I'm, it's not as if I've got some, like, knockdown argument against Sola Scriptura. I just, I'm saying that the proof texts that are often used, I just don't see it, yeah, you know, see. personally. Yeah. And I know for you, perhaps the biggest thing is the was the papacy. The papacy. You said you had, uh, you can correct me, but you had some good Protestant friends say, listen, if you look into this seriously, you'll understand that Catholicism has to be false because the, the papacy, the claims of the, the Catholic Church regarding the, the Pope and infallibility are false, yeah, so, unhistorical, unbiblical. So the way that it, it went down, those three initial items that I was telling you about, so divine simplicity, the Eucharist, and annihilationism, I was like, okay, uh, I, I called some Protestant friends of mine and I was like, hey, look, you know, these are my objections to Catholicism and I no longer have these objections. Like, th and that's basically, th th that's basically my objections. So what, what should I do now? Should ah. I, wh where should I go at this point? And, uh, and I called my Protestant friends. I didn't call my Catholic friends. I called my Protestant friends because at that point I wanted to remain Protestant. And so they, th their advice was, bro, you've got to look at the papacy. Like when you look at the papacy, first of all, it's a distinctive doctrine. So if the papacy is true, pretty much Catholicism is true. But if it's false, Catholicism is false. So it's a very distinctive doctrine. And also, they were convinced that there's really good evidence, historical evidence, and, and there's, there's virtually no biblical evidence for it, too, as was their, their view. And so they were the ones that put me on the path of really looking into the papacy. And so I was, I was really serious about it. Like, I was very serious about investigating the truth claims of the papacy. I really wanted to know because I felt like if I could just, if I could like really narrow in on this one topic, taking their advice, this could really like settle the, the matter for me. And, and how much issue. like emotionally were you hoping that that would be the case? Because as we've already pointed out, it's a difficult and I'm sure an emotionally exhausting thing to so have to change. I have to be honest. So there were emotional reasons against convers conversion but there were also emotional reasons for conversion. So I've attended mass, I've attended uh, really beautiful Catholic churches, and I'm really drawn in as a photographer, like, like my background, yeah. to beauty. I'm really drawn into beauty. And so I've, I've had what I would call, what I would like actually say are, are religious experiences in Catholic churches. I haven't really had those in, in any Protestant churches. I mean, if you just go to any, your run-of-the-mill average Protestant church, they're just, they're going to be, ugly it's gonna be an ugly place honestly mm -hmm. and uh, so so there were emotional reasons I would say on both sides sure and so I, I had to do what I, I could to put the bias to the side and really investigate the truth of it and I tried to do that really tried to do that so where did you go to first to look was it the kind of patristic sources was it the biblical evidence historical evidence so um, the first thing that I did was I wanted to I wanted to have a way of categorizing and putting all of the evidence into like a worksheet or a document that I could like say okay yeah here's this piece of data here's this piece of data all of this speaks to the papacy I don't want to leave anything out I, I love this could you just yeah. give us like an overview of what you mean by this because you were on my show with Dr. Scott Hahn. People should go check that video out because at that point you still weren't convinced of the papacy and it was great to have Scott there. But you actually, so I would like you to talk about this. You, yeah. you created a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet. I mean, I love that even Scott was impressed by that. And Scott <laughs> is a nerd of the most beautiful variety, yeah. right? And so yeah. the fact that he was impressed with that and then you assigned, what, points to each line of evidence for so, and against? So what I did was I, I created a, what, what I call a Bayesian like analysis of... The, all of the evidence for and against the papacy. And so I, I use the Bayesian framework because I think that it's a more formal way of doing like everyday probabilistic calculations that you do on your, in your own, like on, in your head. And you're like, okay, how likely is this event? And you'll say, oh, it's really likely. That might be some, you know, some example that you would just come up with. But uh, in, in Bayesian terms, like what you'll do is you'll assign a figure to that probability 
And right. so you can be a little bit more precise mm. in seeing like, okay, well, how much of an effect probabilistically does this piece of evidence actually have? As opposed to just going on the sort of more informal, okay, this is some evidence, here's yeah. some evidence, here's some evidence, here's a lot of evidence, here's a lot of evidence. How but, many, then you know, but then you don't really know at, at the end of that how it all combines. How many lines of evidence did you have for and against the papacy, roughly? There weren't a lot for the papacy. There, was the biblical, ah. there, there were the biblical arguments. I see. And but there's a lot of Protestant objections. There's a lot of pieces of data that Protestants will say. So I, I, I would say, a, like, count, counting them up, I probably had, like, four for the papacy and about 15 wow. against the papacy. And, and it seems to me that what's interesting about this analysis is that <clears throat> rather than going on your kind of intuition, yeah. you're, you're, you actually don't know what the evidence is going to show yeah. you because yeah. you're going through them one by one and assigning a number. Yeah, and so what I did at the beginning was I, I wanted to be charitable to both sides. Again, I'm trying to fight my bias. So I'm, I'm trying to be charitable to the Catholics. I'm also trying to be charitable to the Protestants. And so what I would do is I would assign a charitable number to each of the, the pieces of data and be like, okay, well, yeah, how likely is this? Eh, like, let's give the Protestant something here. And so we'll give him a little, like, this is a little bit of evidence against the papacy. Can't really say that's a whole lot, but this is still being charitable. And so, but what you can do with the, with the Protestant case is you can accumulate all of these different lines of evidence. So they've got the Didache, they've got these different documents, these early church documents, where you don't see, like, the papacy clearly laid out and specific names and everything and so they'll say this is a document we would expect mm. to find the papacy in this in this early this early document and so and then but there are obviously catholics who want to respond to that like jimmy aiken and be like well no there's actually reason to suspect that they wouldn't have named sp specific names in the early church because why the church was being persecuted so you're not going to just spell out all the names of the most important figures in your religion so that people can just read the letter and then go hunt them down and, and kill them. And so there's there's reasonable like responses to that, but nevertheless, I was still being charitable to the Protestants and giving it some, some weight of evidence against You the would papacy. think if you have around 15 arguments against the papacy and only four yeah. in favor of the papacy, that it's gotta be hard for the papacy to come out on top unless those four arguments are very strong. Yeah, so there's, there's really three passages in the New Testament that are sort of relevant to the, the papacy in terms of like giving some positive boost to it, which is Matthew 16, John 21, and Luke 22. And you, if you look at those three, you'll see that, I mean, I think being charitably, you can say, okay, this does give a little bit of weight to the side of the papacy. But what really surprised me, and this is why I spent so much of my time focusing on this one piece of, of data, is there is this argument called the typological, uh, the, I, I, there's, there's all sorts of names for it, but the typological Eliakim argument, you can sure. call it something like that. But there's a connection, there's a textual illusion between Matthew 16, 19 and Isaiah 22, 22, which talks about the office of Eliakim. And it's a textual illusion back to this Old Testament character Eliakim. And so the argument goes is that Peter, that's mentioned in Matthew 16, 19, is the fulfillment of Eliakim. Mm -hmm. So he's the new Eliakim. He's the type, that's the typological yes. argument, the connection between the Old Testament character, the, the New Testament character. And what you do then is you see that the office of the Old Testament office is going to be very similar in all sorts of ways to the New Testament office. Not, a, not in every way. Obviously there's going to be, because the yeah, new, the, uh, Jesus' kingdom was greater than David's kingdom, there's going to be greater properties that are going to exist in the anti-type, the, yes. the type that you see, yeah, the fulfillment that you see in the, in the New Testament. So it's not going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two, but you're nevertheless going to see some correspondence. And so if you look at what properties Eliakim's office had, then it was very close to the papal office. And so then the question is, does that really transfer over? Does that office transfer over to Peter? And so I was, I was not convinced about this argument for a while, but what I saw was that if this argument is true, and again, I was trying to be charitable to both sides, if this argument is true, it is so unlikely that Protestantism or orthodoxy is true. Again, this is, this is the distinctive doctrine, is the papacy. And so basically it's like, if you've got Peter, he's got these papal-like qualities, 
with his office being the new Eliakim. How likely is that on the papacy? Seems pretty likely that we would find that in scripture. But then you flip it around if you're doing this Bayesian analysis. And then you ask, how likely is that data given something other than Catholicism, something other than the papacy, so like Protestantism or Orthodoxy? How likely is that data? And I just have to say, thinking about it charitably, again, it's got to be super, super low. It's got to be very, very low. I see. And so this, this is really strong evidence for for the papacy if you're convinced of the typological I see. Argument. So if you're not, it doesn't do much damage, but if you are, it's very convincing. Is that what you're saying? Um, there's a caveat there. So I was going to wait to talk about that a little bit later. Let me. Do you mind if I pull up my oh, notes course. and see if there's anything that I've missed? And just while you're doing that, just so for those who aren't aware, when we talk about typology, we're referring to persons, places, and events in the Old Testament um, that foreshadow a greater reality in the New. So St. Augustine says, the New Testament is concealed in the Old, the Old is revealed in the New, and this is not some medieval invention. St. Paul talks about Christ as the new Adam, um, and there are many other examples. Yeah, yeah. One of the, a, a Catholic philosopher I had on the channel recently said that Christianity is a typological religion. And this is one of the things that's really give me, given me like a, a, a better appreciation for the Bible, is the fact that the New Testament ties in Mm. to the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of the mm. Old Testament. It's not as if, I mean, pr as a Protestant, my, my view was kind of like, oh, we could kind of like get rid of the Old Testament. Like, let's forget about it. Let's try to forget about it. Because you have these problematic Old Testament passages about the Canaanites and bears attacking children. It's like, let's, can we just forget about the Old right. Testament? Can we just yeah. like forget about that and just focus on the New Testament because it's this all about is, love? Uh, and the Marcion heresy, isn't it? It's not a new... Well, it's something that I was just sort of like drawn to, yeah. like, uh, you know, uh, unconsciously. Yep, yep, yep. I was like, I wish that I could just do away with the Old Testament. Yes. Because then it would just like... Solve, solve a lot of a lot issues, of especially issues. in your debates with atheists. It's like, yeah. gosh, we could just put yeah. that to one side and yeah. I feel like it wouldn't be as embarrassing. Yeah. But I love that, yeah. It's but then typology saw, helped me see the importance of the Old Testament and how important it is for the New Testament authors, including Jesus. Jesus went through and Luke all the Old Testament scriptures and was like, yeah, this is, Mo Moses had to do this and all that, and that's why I'm here. Yeah. And so it's, it is a typological religion, Christianity. Would, so, would, would you mind if I pressed back against this, maybe try to play devil's advocate with this, or would you sure. rather me not do that? <laughs> um, well, I, I, let me, do you mind if I just Please. continue the, the journey? So at this point, I did start to look into this one argument. So it, because I saw if this argument actually works, then it's really powerful evidence for mm -hmm. the papacy. And so then I wanted to actually study it and look into it a lot deeper. And so <clears throat> as I studied it, I continued to remain sort of agnostic about it. I continued to just see, I mean, yeah, like this argument, I, th there are good reasons to think that it's successful. Right. But then you hear objections from Gavin Ortland, like uh, typology run amok. Right. And like, that seems like a good objection. Yeah. I don't really know. Aren't what to you do just with reading that. into this? How yeah. is it? Yeah. How do you know that these properties transfer over? You don't know that. And so, I remained agnostic about it. And so I was, uh, but I was talking one day with a, a friend of mine who's an expert in, in uh, Bayesian analysis. And I was like, so what do I do at this point? Do I do I just like ignore that piece of data, or what do I do with it if I'm not convinced about this da this data being an actual data point? Do I ignore it and then just like go with whatever the other evidence that I've got. And he was like, no, you don't ignore it. What you do is you cut its probabilistic force in half. If you're unsure about mm. that piece of data, then you cut its probabilistic force in half. And so naturally I went directly to my document and I did that. And the probability after I cut the, the probability in half came out to 0.91, I think. It was, it was 0.90 or 0.91 that the papacy is true. And so that at that point, I was like, that was one of the first points where I was like, this could really be, this this could be it. Like this, this could be the thing that really convinces me of. If that argument if, you know, didn't work, yeah. would the Bayesian analysis still lean in favor of the papacy uh, according that's to what, your that's document? What I'm, that's what I'm saying is that it, it, that may be controversial. I, I got this from an expert in Bayes, sure. so I don't know if that's like a controversial move or, 
or what, but this is what I was, you know, on the, on the basis of talking okay. with one of the world's foremost experts on it, this is something that you can do. What's up? I'm just moving this. Ah, no worries. Yeah. No worries. Everyone thinks that the, uh, your audio is off, but it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, no, my audio is not off. I have yeah. a microphone. Um, so, yeah, so what this is saying is that you can still have the argument play some, some level, or give some level uh. of support, play, have some evidential uh, force, even yeah. if you're not convinced of it. Because if you deny the argument, yeah. that's not an argument in favor against the papacy. Right, because this is an argument for it. So yeah. if you just deny it, then you would just do away with it. So if, you, so if you do have reasons, I, and again, I was in the position of, I see good arguments on both sides. There's good arguments that people have given, uh, like so on Sona, that you know Peter's office will have these papal-like qualities. And then I see arguments from Gavin Ortland, and, and I, I see that side too. And so there's like these equal supports that I can see on both sides of it. So I was kind of like teetering in the middle. And so that's where I was. Now, if, if maybe what you're saying, suggesting is, if you were convinced that Gavin is right, that Peter's office doesn't have these papal-like qualities, then yeah, it's not going to do much work for you. Right. But I was at the point where I was like even on it. So see, yeah. if you're at that point, if you're sort of, if you can see both sides, like I was, being, being the case, then uh, it can have some evidential force. And, and it can indeed have a lot because of how unexpected that data is, again, given uh, what we call in, in the Bayes, we call it the negation. So the negation of the papacy hypothesis. When was it that you saw that then? And kind of concluded the analysis. Um, that was that was probably about a. I want to say it's hard to it's hard to know the exact timeline of that, but I would say it was probably a, a couple of few months before I decided to actually convert. So okay. I, so th there's still more time between yes. those, those two points. So what happened in between those two points? So um, in between those two points, I continued to uh, to study the argument, and so I, I I continued to look into it. But then I really started to consider, because I, be, because I saw this move that can be made in the, in when you do a sort of Bayesian analysis and when you're, you're convinced, equally convinced of both sides of a, of a piece of data like this. Very unique situation. And then I really started to think like, okay, wh okay what, what would actually happen if I were to just like follow this evidence? Like what would actually be the case for me? What, how would this change me, my ministry, my relationship with my wife? Mm. And so I had to like, I had to really think about that. And so I, I decided I'm going to put the brakes on it. Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to chill out for this on a while yeah. and just really sit down and, and consider everything. And so I, I slowed down. I really took my time with the argument. And I also wanted to look into Eastern Orthodoxy, see what the what it was like over there. And so I, I had I, I only had one Eastern Orthodox on the channel. And so the reason for that is I had a, an Eastern Orthodox to, to come on and, and share his story because he converted to Eastern Orthodoxy from Protestantism. And uh, well, I think he came all the way from agnosticism. But um, I eventually I, I got in touch with Michael Lofton, and Michael Lofton has gone through this whole journey as well as yeah. well, where he went from Protestant to Catholic to Eastern Orthodox back to Catholic and uh, I think I got in contact with him one day and I was like hey you know what do you think about Eastern Orthodoxy and he was like immediately his first answer was the papacy and I was like no duh that's what I've been <laughs> studying this whole time and so it just kind of reconfirmed mm. to me that it just comes down to whether or not there's good reasons for the papacy being true yeah big shout out to Michael Lofton he's, he's doing a lot of great yeah. work I'd recommend everyone go subscribe to his channel reason and theology yeah and so it just reconfirmed for me that I need to focus in on that piece of data, the Lyakim typological argument. When, what is, when does this date back to? It was a few months before I decided to come I mean, where does the argument date back to? Oh, the argument. Um, so Daniel Vecchio, is a, he's a Christian philosopher who I think I mentioned I had on the channel. He's found it in, uh, I think, a sixth century source. Okay. So there's wow. a typo typology mm -hmm. uh, mentioned there in like a sixth century source. So I think that there's also probably not a lot, a lot of work that's been done yeah. on searching the church fathers right. for this type of argument because it's a newer argument that not a lot of Catholics have sort of historically. Yes, and, and that's interesting because um, 
you know, the, the medieval saints such as Thomas Aquinas didn't have access to all of the fathers. Yeah. So, for example, uh, thinking perhaps of Mary as the new Eve or when she was on the cross, for example, when in John's gospel, where Christ says, you know, mm. to John, behold your mother. Mm. I went to John's gospel expecting Aquinas to say, you know, the kind of the Catholic argument or, uh, you know, woman, she is the new Eve. And he didn't, and I was a bit surprised at that. And then someone pointed that out to me. It's like it's really today that we have more access, access to, to the early church fathers than ever before. So just yeah, because you don't see it. a popular argument springing up and being developed in the in the Middle Ages doesn't mean it isn't somewhere. Yeah, it, and they didn't have Google back then. They couldn't yeah. just like do a, a search on yeah. New Testament, Old Testament, and see all the different textual allusions that pop up and try to form, formulate arguments. So at this point when you're struggling and you say, I'm just going to put the brakes on, I'm going to rest because I'm aware of what this is going to do to my family, I'm aware of what this might do to my ministry. Like at that point, are you like, guys, give me anything. Like if there's an argument to keep me from Rome, then I'm really, really all for it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's I mean, based on the data, the, the data that I got from my Protestant friends, um, that is that is something that I did. So I, I, I called my Protestant friends. I I, could, I talked to in, in uh, particular Gavin Ortland yeah. at some point. He's and terrific. I said, I, I, which I, have great I love. Respect for him. I love Gavin. He's like one of the best Protestants that's currently speaking on this issue. Yeah. Super and he's gonna, intelligent. He's going to take issue. He, yeah. he probably he probably will have a response video to what, yep. I'm, what I'm saying today. Yep. And and I'm I'm all for it. I, again, I love Gavin. And uh, I called him up one day and I said I I had him just like I did with Catholics. I said. Spell it all out. Give me all. Give me every single piece of data that you have that supports the the, the negation of the papacy that the papacy is false. Give me everything. Yeah. And he did that, and I wrote it all down in my document. And so I had I had what I thought was a, a very representative summary of, of of the evidence that is that is important to the papacy. And then I also like eventually I got a fuller list from uh, Jimmy Aiken, but this was already after I. I uh, decided to convert based on that, that okay. argument. So I had, so now there are some additional data points. I just haven't plugged them in yet from Jimmy Aiken on the, the pro papacy side. How, how did you handle this emotionally once you'd made the choice to convert? What, what's that like? <sighs> Again, it's not like you're just Joe Blow, uh, we say in Australia, I don't know if you say that in America, but in a, you know, in a small town, no one really knows you. It's like, no, you've got this big online following. Um, there's a there's a lot of responsibility there to kind of get this right in mm -hmm. a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so is the question like, what, ha what, how did I feel when I actually decided to? Yeah, how how did you feel? How did you process those emotions? Because we have a lot of people who watch the show, right? Yeah, and they say, so I'm I looking think... into Catholicism, but I don't know what to do. I'm scared. My 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 family, my job, my yeah. So, so was, from from then excited. from then till here, I was very excited that <clears> that day and that night. It got really bad. I mean, I've been very vocal on my channel about the fact that I have struggle with struggles with anxiety and, and depression at points. But that night, I experienced a whole lot of anxiety. Like, because I, I I told my wife that day, I was like, "Hey, I've decided to become Catholic," and uh, her response was like, "Okay." And um, that night, I was I was just thinking, "Did I do? Did I make the wrong choice? Did I? Did I?" And we haven't we we haven't talked about the whole story up until that point. By the way, we haven't gotten through the everything that that went on with the data. Um, but when I got to that point, it was it was very hard, and it's been it's been extremely hard ever since. Mm. So feel free to go back and and flesh out the data more. If yeah. You like. um, well, let me talk about some of the other things that I reflected on. And so as I was thinking, I. I, I wanted to be very sure about this because I, I realized how much it was going to affect my family. And so I, uh, I slowed down and I tried to do my best to acknowledge my bias. I wanted to be like, let's realize, Cameron, that you have emotional reasons to want Catholicism to be true. Yeah. And I did that. And I, I tried to do what I could to acknowledge that and really just assess things logically and assess things you know evidentially probabilistically and so um, I also learned or I not not really learned but I remembered that I'm also a fan of uh, what's called reformed epistemology uh -huh. and phenomenal conservatism 
And these are really big philosophical terms. I'll try to uh, break these down a little bit. But as I was going through this process, one of the things that I mentioned, and I, th I, I kind of tied this into like being biased about it, but for, the, for a while now, as I was studying things, I sort of eventually, the seeming that I had was toward Protestantism. It seemed to me like Protestantism was true. That's what it seemed to me. But at some point before I made the decision, it seemed to me like Catholicism was true. So this was, this was I think, maybe prior to discovering the big thing that I did, talking with the Bayes expert on what you can do when you're sort of unsure about a piece of data. That, I think I was, I was already at the point where it seemed like Catholicism was true to me. And so my seemings, what seemed intuitively the case, had already switched toward Catholicism. But I didn't want to go on that. I didn't want to, I wasn't happy with that. The implications were too, were too massive. And so I didn't want to just like tell my wife, hey, I'm converting because it just seems to me like Catholicism is true. Because what had happened at that point is that I had, I had worked through my objections and I hadn't, I, didn't, I hadn't really had any more objections at that point to Catholicism. I also wanted to say this at some point during this interview is that my situation is not gonna be your situation. My objections to Catholicism may not be your objections to Catholicism. You may have different objections. You may have objections to Mariology, for example, which I didn't have those. And so you may not be in a place where you're ready to accept Catholicism because you may have objections. But at that, where I was is that I had worked through those. And so it seemed to me like Catholicism was the case. So what, what I remembered at that point was that I don't actually believe as a reformed epistemologist, I don't think that you've got to have arguments mm. for your belief in Christianity to be justified or warranted. You don't necessarily have to have arguments in the same way that you don't, I don't have to have any argument that a person is sitting here talking to me. I don't have an argument for that. Right. I mean, like, and if I try to disprove it by saying I'm a sophisticated cyborg, it's like, yeah, yeah well, yeah, I don't maybe I can't disprove it, but it seems to me that you are there. But so. most of our beliefs, most of our beliefs are like that. Yeah. Where you don't, you, you, you believe it based on some, maybe some uh, deep experience that you've got, but it's not as if you like just assess everything so rationally and you just, you have all these arguments for all of your beliefs, including your memory beliefs. Like, no, you remember something and then you believe it because you remember yeah, it. Yeah, like you flew yeah, to like Rome the other day. Yeah, I don't have an argument for that. Right. So what I remembered is that you don't necessarily need it, need an argument in order to be rational about making a decision about something like this. Basically, it was one of the things that I remembered. And, uh, and that ties into both Reformed epistemology and the other thing that I mentioned, the other philosophical uh, principle, phenomenal conservatism. But I, I won't get into d the details on those because it's, I think I've made the point on that, is that it just, I remembered that when it comes to philosophy and what's called epistemology, how you come to know things, my epistemological views made it to such that mm. you can actually, you so, know, I didn't really need an argument right, so in when order you, to, to, to convert to Catholicism. So the seeming, the seeming wasn't as suspect as it first appeared. Yeah, the seeming, the, I could, if I wanted to, on epistemological grounds, I could embrace Catholicism purely on those grounds because I didn't have, I'd worked through those objections and it seemed to me like Catholicism was true. So, but again, that wasn't, that wasn't enough for me because I realized how uh, important everything was. And so what I did then at that point was, okay, I, I really need to study this typological argument. And the, the outcome of that was I watched this four hour video that Swan did on his, his channel, uh, intellectual, what, what, intellectual. Yeah. Conservatism. I, I, no, I, think, I think he just changed it to intellectual Catholicism. Okay. So Swan Sona, though, Swan Sona, S U A N, great guy. Yes, and he's got a four-hour video where he builds the the whole case that the Eliakim typological argument is is a sound argument. And so I worked through that video, and on the basis of working and listening through that video, I became convinced that instead of being where I was sort of agnostic about it, which again still got me to about 0.9 percent, <laughs> I became convinced that it's a good argument. And so when I updated the Bayesian analysis, I think it took me up to like 0.95 instead of 0.92 or whatever. And so, or 0.91. And so that's, at that point, after I became convinced, 
I think it was maybe the next day or the day after where I was like, I just need to do this. I just need, I just need to do it. I need to follow the evidence. I need to, I need to be consistent with where I'm at in, in my seemings, what seems to me to be the case. I need to be consistent with that. And it was not easy. And it hasn't, it, it's been very difficult. Dr. Hahn said, uh, as he, you know, he said he was the most anti-Catholic uh, person he knew. Uh, and if somebody had have told his friends that one day he'd be Catholic, they would have said, there's just no way. Yeah. But he said, as he investigated the evidence, he got to a point where to prolong conversion felt more and more like disobedience. Mm -hmm. Is that? I felt that way too. I even remember distinctly telling my wife that. Hmm. You know, if you don't mind, I just want to do a, a shout out for your Patreon account because, you know, I'm sure you're taking a hit for making this decision. And I, if it's okay, of course it is. I just want to invite everybody who's watching, if you want to support Cameron Bertuzzi, because you've got a fantastic channel, and I know you've got a lot of plans for the channel, and those excellent plans don't just materialize. In Australia, we say water's free, whiskey costs money. <laughs> right. If you want something good, you you, you, you gotta you, pay for you, it. Money helps, and so if people want to go, I think is it patreoncom slash capturing Christianity. patreoncom slash capturing Christianity. Yeah, please please go support our brother because you've got a fantastic uh, apostolate, <clears throat> and I know it's going to continue to do great things for the church. Um, and and you also have a way they can give. Uh, if they want to do a one time, or if they don't want to give on Patreon, you can just go to capturingchristianity.com slash donate. Okay. Yeah, and um. I mentioned in my announcement video yesterday that our ministry is currently operating at a deficit. And so what that means is that we had, at the point that I made my video, um, which we have had uh, a lot of support that has been pouring in. So I, I did want to say thank you guys so much. The, be the best line, can I share it, <laughs> is yesterday we were having dinner, <laughs> eating some pasta, drinking some wine, about to get on some electric scooters which was a bad idea. And uh, I, I texted Michael Lofton and he's like, hey, I just did a video and I told everyone to go support him. And you said, ah, oh, I could kiss his bald head. <laughs> Best line of, of yesterday, it maybe just, the trip. It really means a lot because <laughs> we have been, we've been really struggling the last year or so. Yeah. We've had a, we've had a deficit and we did have a, a period of prosperity with the, with the channel. So we had money in the bank that we were working through and we, but we've gotten to the point where we had a three thousand dollar a month deficit, that yeah, like we can't operate at that. Amount. You can't operate, nor can you expand. No, no, and we can't do what we need to do. I had to, I had to stop making shorts. I had a marketing company that was making shorts for me. I had to stop doing that. I had to stop. We cut all of the expenses that we could that we could cut. Yeah, and things just seemed to be going. And and then this happens, and I'm like, what do I? Yeah, what am I doing? And now I, I, I'm going to make this announcement, yeah. and we're going to lose. And I know from last night speaking to you, you've had people right say, "I can't support this anymore." But and but even the there end, was even a fella, a Protestant fella, saying on it was a video. He told everybody supporting you to stop. Yeah. I watched it last night. Yeah. And people can support you or not support you. Like yeah. no one has to support yeah. you. That's I, I fine. Wanted, yeah. I, yeah, I wanted to say that too. Is that people need to support ministries that they really believe in. Yeah. And so if you feel that way, honestly, like if you feel that way about capturing Christianity, you can't support it anymore. I think that's the right move to make. I think, it, I think it's the right You don't move. need a Bayesian analysis for that. No. It just seems like no. you shouldn't be supporting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, but, but thank you guys for supporting it. Really, yeah. really does mean a lot. I'm really excited to see what the Lord does with your beautiful apostolate. So, okay, what was it like, RCIA? Uh, how did you approach a church? How's it going? So Scott Hahn put me in touch with an RCIA director uh, near me. His name is Michael Gormley. Big shout out, Michael Gormley. Not only is he brilliant, he's as brilliant as he is hilarious. For those who are watching, Goma, his nickname, he's the fellow who runs uh, Catching Foxes. We have beautiful Italian kids waving at us from that window. <laughs> oh, let's move here. I mean, Subinville's great, but... That's awesome. Buongiorno! <laughs> How bad was that? Pretty bad. All right. Um, yeah, okay, so <laughs> we'll edit that out. Uh, <laughs> Michael Gormley is amazing. Yeah, he's He terrific. knows more about Catholicism than anyone. <laughs> he, knows, he knows so much. He was, he was telling me, he, he went to Mass with me the other day, just explaining, like, how it all works. And he was like, 
Yeah, so we genuflect because the first century Christians that, you know, you had to, to kneel down to, the to Caesar oh, yeah. and uh, when he would like cross on the road and they didn't want to do that because it was, and so what they would do instead of, of genuflecting on the left knee, they would genuflect on the right knee. And so that's why you genuflect in the church. He was like, and the reason why we do the sign on the cross is because what we were doing originally is we would do like this little sign on the cross uh, on our foreheads. But then as Nero and, and these other uh, mm. emperors would start to persecute the Christians, then uh, they, they wanted to let everyone know that, hey, I'm a, I'm a Christian. So they would do the sign of the cross across their whole chest. Christian so civil disobedience. It's and a beautiful so, thing. And so uh, there's so, all sorts so, of like, there's all sorts of reasons it's, for like it's everything. It's so good. It's so rich. For everything. It's so rich. I love being Catholic. I'm so grateful to God that I am. So Scott puts you in touch with Goma. With Gomer. And he, he's been amazing. He's been meeting with me one-on-one. -on -one. What, as my schedule allows, well, he's, he's just because made you could me probably teach the class, shop. I would think, at no, this point. No, 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 okay. no. there's way too much to learn. No, uh, I, I know about this one particular thing that I've studied, so I can teach on that. Yeah, if you want a typological argument with the papers, yeah. you sit down, Michael yeah. Gormley. I got this, but <laughs> apart from that, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. So, I, and I, I also did want to mention at some point that there have been some new developments with the typological arguments mm. since the video that Swan put up which uh, is currently being worked on. Swan is doing an updated version of his argument. Would you do me a favor? Give me the link to that video or to the updated video. We'll put it in the description below. Okay. Because obviously we're yeah. just talking freely over wine here. We're not yeah. expecting you to give an academic argument for this, but it yeah, might help right. people who are interested. Right. We'll put that up soon. But I did want to just let you guys know there are some new developments. And, and, and this is not something that you know that was, was doing all of this work convincing me that Catholicism is true again. But uh, there are some new developments that will be highlighted soon that I think uh, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. Mm. So it's going to make the case even even stronger. So when do you get confirmed, brought into the church so, officially? So uh, it was going to be November 20th, okay. which, what is today? The 18th. I don't know. Yeah. It's the 18th. Uh, so it was going to be the 20th, but um, we decided that it was too soon. Yeah. We, talking with, with Michael and he and his wife were, were praying over the whole situation and everything. and. Uh, we, we both agreed that it was best to wait. So we're waiting until Easter. What are some uh, sort of unexpected uh, surprises that you've had about Catholics? Because you just said something that I think would shock a lot of Protestants. You said this, Gomer and his wife were praying over this. You know, mm. like, like I, I, I mean, there are a lot of bad Catholics, you know, and, and I'm one of yeah. them. And sometimes I'm worse. That's why I went to confession the other night, you see. Um, well, but, one thing that yeah. I didn't, I mean, this may not be necessarily tied to Catholics, but one thing that's really like been a surprise to me is that it's really um, ignited my spiritual life. Hmm, my, spiritual, so? my spiritual life was super dry. It was super dry. I didn't pray, didn't even read my Bible that much or study. And uh, it wasn't always like that. I'd, had, I'd have my periods of being up and down. So, but I was very spiritually dry. And one thing that sort of just happened as a result of this is understanding that there's all sorts of things in Catholicism that can help you mm. enter into a deeper and richer spiritual life, including like your prayer life doesn't have to be spontaneous and yeah. extemporaneous. You can follow a, a, a written prayer, just like what Jesus, you know, commands in the... With the uh, Our Father, with Our Father, for example, yeah. Yeah, and so there's all sorts of things that yeah, you can I, do. One of so my, I, yeah, keep going, sorry. Well, my, my spiritual life has, has been reignited as a result of this, and that was not something that I expected. Well, and I know, I know that people are going to be like... Yes, that's well, gonna, the way he's not reading his... Yeah, of course. That's going to... Uh, that is one like, of the difficult things about, about that, coming but. out public about this is yeah. there's nothing you can say that I people just, aren't yeah, going to use against you. Yeah. But I think yeah. what I saw last night in some of the comments from your wonderful Protestant friends, and I... I mean, you've been my Protestant friend for so long, and I love you, and I, I love, I, and I'm not just saying that to sound patronizing, like, I really do learn a lot from my evangelical friends about, you know, their devotion to scripture, the small group communities, their love of Christ, the, this, there's a lot I do learn from them, and I love it, um, but one thing I love about being Catholic is the seasons of the church, it's like, mm. which I haven't even learned here comes Advent, yet. buckle yeah. up, you know, yeah. and then, you know, it's like the Christmas season that starts at Christmas, you know, and and then you've got the beautiful, the rosary, and then you're, you, you know, the praying, the praying the hours, perhaps in the morning and evening. It's kind of like your marriage. It's like if the only time you thought your marriage was going well is when you felt really emotionally 
kind of satisfied it's like well that comes and goes maybe you had a bad night's sleep maybe you haven't had your coffee maybe you're sick but if love is more than that if it's about my duties you know um and i know i'm i know many protestants would agree wholeheartedly with that but you know that's beautiful to hear that your prayer life is yeah so. it's been it's is been there really a particular amazing. devotion that you feel maybe drawn to because just a, a word of warning okay okay I think sometimes Protestants become Catholic and they get really excited and they want to do everything and they get exhausted really quickly. Mm. We have Catholics nodding. Were you a Protestant at all? No. Um, and it's just like there's too much. There's a billion chaplets. There's a billion different, well, okay, there's several colored scapulars. You know, there's all these different things. Um, and I love Jose Maria Escriva's advice. He says, There are many devotions within the church's treasury. Choose only a few and be faithful to them. So I, I don't. I, I honestly don't even know what you mean by like different devotions. Like, okay. what does that even mean? Well, the Rosary, pro- the Divine Mercy yeah, Chaplet. So, so uh, I mean, no, I don't. I don't have anything that I'm like super. One thing, and I don't know if this is even related, but something that I've been sort of contemplating a lot on recently is the fact that like asking the saints to intercede. Intercede, yeah, intercede on your on your behalf. Like that has just opened up a whole new resource to me that I, you know, had never done as a Protestant. And so I find myself in my prayer life, like asking a saint to pray for me. You think of Hebrews 12, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Like imagine the man, you know, in the arena who's striving, but for some reason he's completely unaware that everyone's around cheering him on. And then all of a sudden you become aware. That's beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So that, that's, that's one of the, the big things that I've, What's the Sorry, weirdest thing about Catholicism that you think is going to take you a while to overcome, even emotionally? All the different things you have to do. Like, <laughs> like there's like a what? lot of rules. And that's, that's one thing that, like, my wife and I have been talking about, too, is that, like, there's just a lot of things you just have to do and have to accept. Yeah. And so it's like, there's, like, a long list of things, like, in the catechism yeah. that you just, you have to accept all of it. And it's like, yeah. and that's, that's kind of difficult. To, to be very honest. I mean, I see how, like, the, the analogy that I was giving was that, like, all of the different things that you've got to do and, and, and believe as a, as a Catholic, you might say that those are the leaves. Okay. But what I've discovered is the trunk. I've, I've huh. discovered, like, the foundation of, of all of that. Huh. And so, to, and then you eventually see, like, okay, this connects to this branch. Ah. That branch leads out to then this, this leaf. So it's and not random, that, random, it's not, arbitrary it's not teachings. Random, yeah. it, there's a unified whole. Yeah, here. and it all goes back to Jesus. Like, Jesus is the trunk. Amen. Jesus is the one who established the church. Yeah. And established a new kingdom. And but so, in a way, don't you think it's going to be less tiring? Because I think one of the things I would find difficult about being a Protestant is, gosh, I, how do I, I mean... You well, know, I kind of looked at it yeah. like it was very freeing it was it, and that's one of the things that i've had to give up as as a catholic is like mm. you don't just have the freedom to to believe whatever you want and do whatever you want well yeah to to a certain degree you know what i yeah, mean yeah yeah but so that was one of the things that was kind of pulling me back from catholicism was the fact that like even when it comes like some of these central doctrinal beliefs there's obviously wiggle room within catholicism on these sort of tertiary doctrines yeah, different right? interpretations different, perhaps yeah. different ways of phrasing it yeah and so you have different models and different things and so there, there is like variety in the catholic faith but at the same time like you don't have as near nearly as much freedom no. like ecclesiologically yep in in things that you believe and so i was kind of worried about that i was like i kind of like just like reading the bible and then just being like all right that's how it seems to me you know yeah. or like hearing an argument from something and be like it seems like a good argument and then just like going with that. But as you're probably already discovering, there's a new greater freedom that comes from realizing you don't have to be a yeah. brilliant historian or a patristic yeah. scholar. Mm. You don't need to read all of Martin Luther. Like who has the time or the intellect, very few, to go back into every council and, and then pick apart and say, okay, he was right, but he was wrong. Mm-hmm. The church got it right here. She got it wrong there. It's like you get to a point where you just sort of submit your intellect to the church Christ established and put in charge of teaching there's a freedom that comes from it i think yeah how do you deal with there being so many bad catholics so many scandals in the press i heard just today what happened where was it well it doesn't matter but there's there's more you know sex scandals and wicked people 
you know, um, who are doing horrible things. So I how could had this be? The, how could this be the Christ, the so Church Christ established, if this is happening? Yeah, I actually had a. In my Bayesian document, I actually had that as some evidence against the papacy, like bad the popes. bad popes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I use that as like that. That's a little bit unexpected if the papacy is true. How yeah. unexpected? It's hard to say yeah. because when you actually spell out what the papacy actually is, it doesn't say that popes have got to act, you know, perfect or whatever. It'd be great if they did. So they should be. be. They nice. should be godly. Yeah. It'd be nice. It'd be nice if all Catholics acted in good ways. But we have to continually realize that we're sinners and that it affects everyone. And Protestants are in the same boat. It's not as if they've got some, like, silver bullet that's going to take care of this issue either. There's bad Protestant pastors who commit adultery and do all sorts of bad things. And just because th there's Catholics that do it doesn't mean that there aren't Protestants. And so I, I think that, to me, it's like, if it's an argument against Catholicism, it's an argument against Protestantism too. And so it, if it is an argument against Catholicism, it's actually an argument against Christianity more generally, but I don't think that's actually yeah. a good argument. I heard someone say once, you don't judge the medicine based on those who haven't taken it. Mm. You know, you, 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 ba you judge the medicine based on those who have, mm -hmm. and those are the saints. Yeah. You look at their yeah. lives. Yeah, you know? the saints. That's another thing that's just been really cool is to like, to, to see some of the lives of the saints. Because, I mean, as you learn, if you're going in through confirmation or whatever, you pick a, a patron saint to be, what is it? Yeah, your, your patron your, saint, your, confirmation your confirmation saint. Your confirmation saint. And so I've been uh, <laughs> really thinking about that and like, who, who am I going to, to choose? As, that's another thing that's just really cool about Catholicism is that it, it sort of show it, it, it integrates, I would say, like humans, you know, it, it integrates humans into the whole thing. And it's like humans are involved in this. That's that's what the Bible is all about. It's, it's about humans and, and it's OK to celebrate the humans that have gone on to, to be exemplars, you know? And I, I don't know, I think that that's just, that's just really cool that like the whole thing about saints is kind of cool to me. Uh, also, also because I, I, I'm a real big fan of the soul building theodicy, which is a, a, an answer to why God allows so much suffering in, in the world, mm. is that he does that in part because uh, it helps build our character. And so uh, the, the, the saints are paradigmatic examples of soul building to me, a lot of these cases. When you look at him, you just look up. I mean, even some of the recent ones, like Maximilian Colby. I was wearing uh, his his face on my shirt the other day. He is such a paradigmatic example of the way that God can use suffering in someone's life to build these or, or exemplify. I, I'm I'm failing to to come up with a, a non philosophical term for it exemplify these great goods these great goods of sacrifice and his story is is really mm. particularly in, incredible in that he was sent to auschwitz and as a catholic priest he was like uh, i i don't think that they were necessarily like um, trying to kill him first or whatever but he was discipling people and, and helping yep. others that were that were there along with him as being prisoners and there was this one guy a jewish man Friend, yeah who was being sent to, to death, mm -hmm. and along with uh, with many other prisoners to die of starvation, mm -hmm. and he said, he, "This guy is crying out for his life. I have kids. I have kids. I have a wife. I have kids," and the and the priest just goes, I'm, "Take me instead." Maximilian just goes, "Hey, just take me instead. I'll, I'll do it," and like no one could believe it. Like I was this Catholic guy wants to die in place of this Jewish man. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I was in Auschwitz this year. And or he may not have been Jewish. He may have been. No, you're right. Franciszek Guy of he, he, he was, was a he Jew. Jewish? Yeah, okay. yeah. He was actually here at Kolbe's canonization process and, and spoke at it. Right. Yeah, and then did a pilgrimage to Auschwitz every year until his death, honoring the man who saved his life. But but when I was in Auschwitz, what shocked me was, I just figured that he was one brave hero among many. Mm. So I felt a little silly asking our tour guide if she had heard of uh, Maximilian Kolbe, and she says, of course and there's like there's like a big candle in that salvation bunker there's there's a big plaque dedicated to this man and th they say that in the starvation chamber they were used to hearing screams and groans and mm. he was hearing the catholics confessions he was praying with them oh mm -hmm. my gosh how good is the lord how good is the medicine he wants to give us if we'll just take it huh you know yeah. 
I got the joy of doing the Scavi tour the other day, where you go beneath the Vatican. Yes. Beneath I the St. Peter's. I didn't get to do it. I'm so upset. Maybe we'll try it tomorrow morning. Maybe someone will hook us up. Pope Francis, if you're watching, surely you can pull the strings. <laughs> but it was such he's a here. joy. He's here. He's somewhere over there. Is he? Yeah, where is he? Well, we don't he's, know. He's over there. No, I, I saw it this morning. I saw where he lives. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. It's right on the other side of the Basilica. But what was fascinating to me, right? He said, like, Nero hosts a, a circus here. And he mar kills uh, St. Peter, who was mm -hmm. crucified upside down. The new Eliakim. Yeah, the obelisk that we see here. Did I s pronounce that right? Is the, maybe one of the last things he sees before he dies. Here's what else is cool. Obelisk. This was taken from Egypt <clears throat> to Rome to show that the Romans are greater than the Egyptians. And then the friggin' Catholics take it and put a cross on top of it. <laughs> Boom! I love that. Yeah. The subsuming of all things and giving it to the glory of God. But what was fascinating to me, right, is St. Peter's, uh, well, the, the altar at St. Peter's is built upon another altar, upon another altar. And it was only in the 1930s. It was always believed that St. Peter's bones were beneath the altar. It wasn't until the 1930s we actually had archaeological evidence of that fact. I got to go down there. I got to see the bones of Peter. The Why are you telling me the story? <laughs> <laughs> to make you jealous. <laughs> and so you come back and do a round two. But no, the, the beauty, I was just standing there. It was like I went to a CrossFit gym and realized how out of shape I was. Mm. I'm among the saints and I'm like, I am terrible. But again, I got to do something about that. I got to go to confession. And it's such a, how excited are you to make your first confession? More excited than I should be. And people may not be able to, to really like, understand, why are you so excited to go to confession? But I don't know. I just, I'm so excited that that's a part of Catholic life. Like confess, you, you get to go confess your sins to someone else, which the Bible says to do. And then the guy can uh, absolve you. He absolves you of your sins. And you which the Bible says you can. And you don't have to do mental gymnastics to feel forgiven. Yeah. I, I, I've heard Protestants say this sometimes. They'll say, I would go into my room if I had committed some grave sin and I, I would confess. And I would do that until I felt mm -hmm. forgiven. But you go to the sacrament of confession and when he says, I absolve you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Doesn't matter how you feel. It's been done. Mm. It's really cool. I love confession. And it's, it's cool because, I mean, a lot of our lives are spent kind of posturing, unfortunately, mm -hmm. until yeah. we grow in sanctity. We yeah. tell people the good things about ourselves. You do not go to confession to tell the priest what you've done well. You go and you're like, I'm a schmuck. And he's like, I know. Tell me more. <clears throat> it's, it's a cool, even just a, on the... How often do you go? Because I, I, what I've learned is that you, you have to go once a year. Yeah. I go... Once a year, once a year seems like so... But this is, how, this is how good Holy Mother Church is. She's so kind and she's so gentle. So when you say, like, you've got to believe everything in this catechism, the church realizes that, like... You may not, but that doesn't make you a formal heretic, maybe just a material heretic. I mean, we have many false beliefs, but that we're not culpable for. Mm. The church is so gentle, so loving, and so saying once a year is like, this is the least. We love you, you know. The church doesn't want to put a burden upon us that would put us outside of the grace of God. So I go once every two weeks, once a month. Yeah. Mm. Drag my kids. What's cool is my kids want to go. Actually, it's weird. They want to go. It's not weird, though. It's not weird. No? No. I think like, you want to go tell beautiful. this strange man all the bad stuff you've done? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you kind of, like, you kind of get to get it off your chest, and, like, and then you get to move on. Yeah. It's, it seems yeah. kind of... Which, I mean, you know, Protestants are going to say, you can just do that directly with God, and fair enough, but... Yeah. And you can. That's yeah. the thing. Like, why can't I just go straight to God? It's like, yeah. if you can. Yeah, no you one can. said you can. Why can't I pray just directly to God? You can. Yeah. You it's like pray Catholicism is but, the both but why do you why do you ask your friends to pray for you? Yeah. If you can go straight to God. So, capturing Christianity. Yeah, yeah. What, okay. What, what's so, going to happen? What, what are the plans? What is the five-year vision, which you may not have thought of, but let's do it. I don't have the, the <laughs> full five-year. Well, the, the vision had kind of like been going like this because of our, our situation. This man just intuited my needs. I looked at him oh, and he goodness. brought the wine over. Wow. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things that, that we've been wanting to do for a while is hire, which we, the, the firm that we were using to create our shorts, I'd like to hire them to create shorts and clips 
yeah. and handle our social media and do all of it because that that's something that really ties me down and, and it's yeah. it requires a lot of work and, and effort to do that but I, what i need to be doing is focused on creating the new content the new the new direction for the channel so that's one thing that we're really looking forward to to being able to do that now what we're doing right now this deficit that that i explained earlier is there a bug on my head no you look good um thanks uh the deficit that we're that i was talking about earlier is to cover our expenses mm -hmm. so if you know, we, we do get to the point where we get an excess. You will by the end of this episode, won't he, Catholics? That would, I mean, that, that'd, be, <laughs> that'd be an answer to prayer. But what we would do with that money is then use that to hire an advertising firm to yeah. create shorts, to create clips, handle the thumbnails, handle the titles, and make them SEO friendly and do all of that, handle our social media, post clips to Instagram and do all the things and like that would be that would be amazing. And I know that you do that on, on yours and it's very successful. But that's one thing that we're looking forward to, to do. What about your in-person conferences that you've been doing? Yeah, so we're right now what we do is we have uh, two events a year, two special events. One of them is CC Exchange where we have uh, two people on each side of an issue come together and have conversations. And then we have our annual CCV in conference and we just finished our ccb2 conference in august and it was on the topic of science and god and the next one is going to be on religion which uh, if we can raise you know the support to to get to that point then we're going to obviously continue doing these conferences and the next one's going to be on the resurrection so wow. uh and and Brittany is the mastermind behind your wife my wife she's the mastermind behind all of our conferences the reason why she's on board with capturing christianity full-time and the reason why we need funds is uh, so that we can do these special events and conferences take a whole lot of time and effort to, to throw together. And if you've been to one, then you see how much work Brittany does. And so, uh, yeah, so conferences, the CC exchange that we'll do once a year and then the CCV3 next year in, uh, in, in August. And then uh, my long-term goals eventually to be as cool as you to have my own studio where I can fly people in and have like incredible lighting yeah, and a, an amazing little space and do like really cool lights and beams and yeah, not fog necessarily, but cool, <laughs> like a cool aesthetic and everything. And uh, like that, that's my ultimate dream. My ultimate dream is eventually hire people to, to come on and to do capturing Christianity full time oh. and to, to do kind of like what Gregory Pine does on your channel. Yeah. We've got someone else to come on and he speak says hi, and, by the way. Oh yeah. He, t he emailed me today and said he's going to celebrate Holy Mass for you and your family oh, wow. tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. That's what amazing. a guy. What a guy. I love when you say that. What a guy. What a guy. Oh, what a Stop guy. it. What a guy. Is it being cool too, just to kind of like show up in Rome and meet these priests and you're like, I'm, I'm part of this we family now. We met this brilliant guy yesterday. Oh my gosh. Was it yesterday? He was amazing. He's yesterday. incredible. Yeah. And I was telling you in the car, I was like, this guy is like, he's brilliant. He's like one among many. Yeah. There's so many people like this so that you many meet good people. in Catholicism. The guy that you're, uh, your spiritual mentor that, that uh, when I was, we were in the backyard of uh, Oh, Father Plato's. Boniface. Yeah, my like man, him, him he's boy. another example. Plato himself, Alex Plato, yeah. who was on your channel recently. Like all of these, there's so many examples of brilliant Catholic I think thinkers. that's right. Uh, the, the impressiveness the sanctity of the good Catholics is far more interesting and impressive. Hey, we were just talking about you. <laughs> we, just, we just talked about you. <laughs> do you want to come up? Do you want to come up here and say hi? <laughs> yeah, no pressure now that we yeah, just no, built no you pressure. up. I mean, friggin' Socrates, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> this guy is <laughs> like the new player. Hey, what if, well, I would step out and let no, you know. No, he can just, he can just uh, okay. scoot over here. They, I think they can use the, the wide shot. Oh, good. How's it going? We're doing well. Good to Great see to you. see you. Yeah. Great to see you, Father. Just look over hey, there. Man. Great to see you. Hi, everyone watching live. This is the guy we're talking. I don't even remember your name. I'm Father sorry. Michael Baggett. Michael Father Michael Baggett. Baggett. I'm unforgettable. I should remember that. Great. That's great. So what were you saying? Was it true? I, everything. 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 Everything is true. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We talked about it, I, we talked about the whole journey. Some of the things that we talked about the other day. Beautiful. Yeah. And so. Well, it's great to have you as a brother in the church, my friend. Yeah. We're all excited for you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Thanks. Well, I'll see you soon, Matt. Yes. So yeah. I'm going to be interviewing <laughs> Father Michael tomorrow. 
I, we, it won't, we won't release it live, I don't think, but we will release it at some point. It's going to be an excellent discussion on Within it. Within the next decade, it, you're going to hear an exclusive <laughs> interview. And it's going to blow your Brad. mind. That's right. <laughs> so use this next decade to prepare. <laughs> right. All right. Well, thanks for letting me right, sabotage yeah. this yeah, big yeah, moment. Yeah, no problem. It's so good to be here with you yeah. in this incredible backdrop. Oh, glory to God. Did you know today yes. is the anniversary of the dedication of yes. St. Peter and Paul's Basilica? That's amazing. I did not know that. Did you already I, tell me that? I went, I got to go to Latin Mass in the, what do you call it, the tombs, the crypts? Yeah, the crypt area. It was a joy. Mm. Yeah. What a fitting day yeah. to share yeah. your journey. Glory yeah. to God. Good. Amen. Amen. Well, well you're, you can come on my interview okay. if you'd like. Okay. And you can totally sabotage it. Okay. So you've earned it. You've earned it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Padre. Thanks, up here. Looking forward to having a limoncello with you soon. Oh, that sounds great. Uh, some pe we have over 3,000 people watching right now. Oh my I've been following this brother for quite some time. This is you. Should Zubert. we take some, some questions? Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's good. All right. And knew he would come home. His love for Christ kept him, kept him searching. All right. Let's go to our massive thanks to our local supporters. Again, we're going to do an exclusive live stream for our locals in a couple of hours. Lemoncello in hand. But let's see if we can take at least a few questions my goodness gracious let me see is there something really catholic you want to get before you go home like a bible that's complete <laughs> uh one thing that i would like is a is like a cross necklace oh dude yeah. i'll buy it for you okay yeah i've been looking for one for a while but yeah i'd like i'd like something like that keep, i'm not much keep, of a necklace guy yeah but or like jewelry and in, in like I've got my wedding ring. When I was uh, in my 20s, or maybe earlier, I was like a big rings. It was weird, I had a face. Okay, but <laughs> back, back to the bling, now you're Catholic. All right, so we have 35 questions. This we're is, not gonna get we're not gonna get through them, no. but also feel free to give inadequate, short, lightning round answers. Awesome. Stacy B says, was Cardinal John Henry Newman an influencer for you? No. Aldo and Isabel says, can we support him on Locals if we don't like Patreon and prefer and prefer it to his website? We do have a Locals account, but it's not active right yeah, now. So I, rec you. Yeah, you I recommend capturingchristianity.com slash donate where you can do one time or monthly if you don't like Patreon. Dunk Boy says, any book recommendations that really helped you in joining the Catholic Church? Unfortunately, there is not a book length treatment of the argument that I was talking about. And so I can't recommend like Swan is working on, I think, a book that he'll eventually publish on this argument. But there is there is no book length treatment, unfortunately. That can what, Was there a, a perhaps most helpful book not having to do with the papacy necessarily that you thought this is a really good book that helped me with the Catholicism in general or? Um, People have been sending me books since, since that point. <laughs> since you've been on my show. Yeah. So, like, I, uh, you have a library I mean, at home? Yeah. I've, there was a, a book. I can't remember the, the title of it. Okay. But there was the one book that was uh, specific to the papacy, but I can't remember the title of it. Chris asks, when someone is caught up on limited historical proofs, what can they do to sincerely restore their faith? Theological arguments often sound good in my brain, but they don't always convince my heart. So I end up feeling distant from God. Can you repeat the first part of that? When someone is caught up on limited, I'm not sure what he means by this, historical proofs, what can they do to sincerely restore their faith? Perhaps what he's saying is mm. these proofs aren't fully convincing to me. Mm -hmm. um, maybe what you should do is familiarize yourself with the word. You, you may just not be familiar with like the best arguments that there are for the resurrection. So two resources that I would recommend on that. One of them is Richard Swinburne's The Resurrection of God Incarnate. He's Greek Orthodox, by the way, but he's got an amazing book, but as if it's like a bad thing. He's, he's got an amazing book on the resurrection, and he approaches it from a Bayesian standpoint. So mm. he, he's got, at the end of his book, and think in the appendix, he's got all the calculations that he wow. uses, and he, he ends at a probability of either, I think it's a 0.97 that the resurrection is true. So wow. that means 97%. And he uses very conservative <laughs> wow. uh, figures for his calculations. So that's one resource. Another resource is the, the essay in the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology by Lydia and Tim McGrew. They also have work beyond that article that I mentioned there. But if you look up the McGrews on the resurrection, top-notch stuff. So you may just not be familiar with like 
the strongest arguments that there are for the resurrection. Stephen says, my biggest obstacles to conversion was Marian dogmas, praying to the saints, and the sacrament of reconciliation, converted from evangelical to Catholic in 2019. And these issues stem from pride, he says. Mm, uh, I know we've, dis we've discussed some of this, but feel free if you want to take another swing at it. How well, has these issues gone for you? Yeah, so Mariology is something that um, seems foreign to me. It still seems foreign, but it's, it's never been really an objection of mine. And the reason for that is because even though I didn't grow up with those beliefs about like Mary's immaculate conception or the fact that she was a perpetual virgin, virgin I didn't have an argument for the conclusion of the, the the Protestant beliefs that I sort of grew up with, and so when I kind of looked into things, uh, I, there was a there's a book by Brant Petrie on mm. um, the Jesus, Jewish the, the Jewish, Jewish roots, roots the Jewish Mary? roots of Mary. Yeah, yeah, and in one of those sections, he, he talks about the fact that, like could the brothers of Jesus be referring to like maybe Jesus's cousins or something mm -hmm. and someone else? And uh, there he he actually does give a, a a pretty compelling case in there that 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 might be the case. But it was never really an objection of mine because, I, again, I don't really know how to formulate an argument for the, the Protestant positions on, on, on those subjects. So uh, and I, I, it's not that I haven't tried. It's just that I haven't found, like, a good argument yeah. for it. And so, so I, it's never really been an objection of mine, although I still think it's still very foreign to me. So. Now, just a heads up to some of these locals who are asking questions. Some of these questions I'm not going to ask because they're about personal issues that Cameron hasn't asked me, uh, wants to keep private, which of course we respect. And so that's, I'm not snubbing you. I'm just, that's why I'm not asking your questions. Yeah. Jacob says, Cameron, who was the biggest influence for you to start an investigation on what the true faith is? The, pro <laughs> probably you, probably you, because I had never, never, thought about the the Catholic versus Protestant debate until you invited me to come on your show to talk about something completely unrelated. It was reformed epistemology and uh, the argument from contingency. And so we talked about those things on your channel, but then we did a separate thing on my channel where we looked at yeah. like, you know, some, some of the objections in it and I kind of like shared my thoughts. And that was like, I think in that, that uh, video, which now has over a uh, hundred thousand views, uh, maybe more at this point but uh, in that video one of the things that we talked about was the Eucharist and that was one of the first times that I had re actually read John 6 mm. and been like that is pretty straightforward actually and it, it, you you were the one you were the sort of catalyst that got me thinking about these issues but um, not to like degrade you at all but it, I didn't look at like Matt Frad when I was trying to decide like is the papacy true yeah no. I wasn't looking for That's a like, good idea Matt Frad's arguments on, on no I'm, I'm happy to be the tip of the spear yeah. <laughs> Joe Ward says favorite part of Rome also a new convert mm. and would love to make a pilgrimage what's your favorite part of Rome this has got to be your best the Vatican this look at it St. Peter's Basilica oh Lord if thank you ever been in St. Peter's Basilica I mean I've, I've been here uh, about Ooh, seven or eight years ago as a Protestant and I remember going in and just just like it's hard to even comprehend that this is a real structure <laughs> I know it really is you walk in and you're like how is this here how am I having this experience like of it, it looking must, at this it must have dropped down from heaven who yeah yeah who did any any of this uh, Chris says what are the top theological arguments that tripped you up the most while considering conversion what are the top theological arguments that maybe were obstacles to your conversion? We've kind of been through that. Yeah, but. yeah. Annihilationism, divine simplicity. Um, will Helfam says, what advice does Cameron have for a Catholic who is helping a previously agnostic friend discern or convert to Catholicism? To convert to, to yeah, so, Catholicism so this or from agnosticism, from agnosticism all the way? Yes, all the way. Yeah, so there's, again, there's kind of steps, and that's why I think that it's important that capturing Christianity be that first step yeah. from atheism to yeah. Christianity. And so, so good. So yeah, what I would suggest is uh, there's a, there's an amazing book that I can recommend that you read if you want to have like a really good argument for the existence of God that is, is very uh, accessible, very generous to the skeptic, to the atheist. What is it? It's called How Reason Can Lead to God. Ah. Yes. By Dr. Josh Rasmussen. Have you, a, you've had him on guy. your show, right? I, I have. I need to have him in person. Oh, yes. What a guy. That would be amazing. His uh, book I'll, is... I'll fly you to the Vatican when you convert. <laughs> Deal? Josh? No? <laughs> All right. 
Uh, being a Batuzi, says Rachel, do you feel like Catholicism is in your blood? <laughs> it probably is somewhere. Yeah, well, it, yeah. But I, I grew up very charismatic Protestant. Okay, Tommy Lee says, Cameron, have you chosen a patron confirmation saint yet? I've been, no, I haven't chosen one. I, I'm considering Maximilian Kolbe, but I haven't, I haven't. Is it Kolbe or Kolbe? Col See, I, Kolbe. I thought, I thought it was Kolbe. Kolbe, but yeah, you American Kolbe say sounds, things. Kolbe sounds more like... Colby. Uh, whatever you like. Colby. Uh, Heidi says, would you, Cameron, be willing to share your experience, excuse me, of at Mass that moved you to really want to be Catholic? Um, one of the things that I remember distinctly going to Mass in Georgia with you at the... Uh, the, the Divine Liturgy? The, the Divine yeah. Liturgy was the reverence that I experienced because in Protestant church, it's not... It's not very reverent. Granted, it, it depends on the church and it depends on the pastor. And the, sure. it, maybe that's another reason why Protestantism isn't true, but um, it's, not, it's not one that I would like defend as an actual argument. I was just making a joke. Yeah. But um, what am I even talking about? Uh, that's okay. <laughs> Holy Mass, uh, there was this experience the perhaps. That, it was the reverence. I yeah, the, 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 the reverence of uh, the, the priest face forward, which I know that there's like, there's different in English, the, the regular liturgy, the regular English liturgy, they face forward now and some of those changes. Sometimes, yeah. As a result of Vatican I? Well, here we go. It's a big debate, but uh, somewhat <laughs> time after Vatican II, though it wasn't called for in the documents, right, Padre? That's right. We could talk a lot about We'll talk okay. about that when you have Father, when we, we'll have Cameron on your podcast. And you can... Okay. Uh, the Kingdom Scribe says, Thanks be to God. Praying for your continued journey, Cameron. Question. Do you think your conversion will affect many other Protestants to cross the Tiber? Why or why not? I think it can, but that is not necessarily my goal right. in doing this. Right. The goal today is to share my personal story because I've been very public about my journey. And so I think I owe it to everyone that's been watching to at least spell that out and explain what the purpose of that is. And I, I, I wanted to say, though, that um, something I kind of mentioned earlier is that your objections to Catholicism may not be my objections to right, Catholicism. Right. So your, another philosopher's term, noetic structure, your web of beliefs, the beliefs that you have, may make it such that Catholicism, in your view, is false. And I want to say, I think that can be, it's a person relative, but I think that if you've got that set of beliefs where you, wherein you think, You've got some argument or some reason to think that Catholicism is false. I don't want to. I don't want to say to that person, "You're being irrational." Yes. I want to say, I, I nevertheless, you know, I, I disagree at this point, given my set of beliefs. But I think that someone on the other side can be perfectly within their epistemic rights. Mm -hmm. Their they can be justified in their their belief. So I, I'm not coming at this trying to proselytize or trying to convince people to become Catholic. But nevertheless, I think that some of the things I've talked about today might move someone in that direction a little bit. Pope Francis will be happy. Okay, do you... Th um, <laughs> Pope Francis will Well, he talks, to, he talks against I proselytizing. Know, know, this wasn't a criticism. He makes the distinction between evangelism and, and proselytism. You mm. know? Uh, how does he feel this will affect his current follower-listener base? So I, I had to... Um, and this is something my, my wife helped me with a lot, and I'm very thankful to her to, to help me out with this. But I had to really think about the impact that this was going to have on capturing Christianity. And I had to think long and hard, is it, what, what's going to happen with this channel now? Is it going to become just another Catholic channel where it's like pure Catholic content, it's, we're always going to be defending Catholicism, or are we going to stick to our roots and defend beliefs that are central to all Christians and that all Christians can get behind? And that's something that it took a lot of thought and reflection to finally come to that realization that, no, we need to stick to our... Like the reason why I think God blessed this ministry in the first place was to do that, was to serve that function. Yeah. And so that's, that's one of the things that I think is hopefully helping to mitigate. I, I know that a lot of Protestants and a lot of supporters are going to be upset about this, if, especially if you disagree and you think that you've, you know, you've got reasons to, to object to Catholicism. So I, I completely understand that. And I, 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 again, I want to emphasize that you're totally please support the ministries that you really believe in. So, 
Tasha W says, first, thank you for previously talking about your past struggle with anxiety. That really helped me and was a consolation at a difficult time. My question for you is how can we pray for you and support you and your family at this time? Welcome home, brother. Um, pray for peace. Pray for peace is the main thing because that, that covers so many different aspects of the anxiety yeah. that's a result of it. And so uh, just pray for peace. Joey says, what can Catholics do better? Know what they believe. Alex, <laughs> that's good. I think it's great. Catholic.com. Uh, Alex says, what is your favorite leisurely activity? So a softball question, perhaps. Oh, uh, I, what I do you do for playing, fun? I enjoy playing video games with my friends. What's your favorite video game? Super Smash Brothers. Nice. I, I even started yeah. a new gaming channel. I saw that. Uh, What's it called? It's called CC Gaming. Ooh. Yeah, where I do like Catholic I, I Christianity <laughs> Gaming. It, this could be your Catholic channel. You could grow that. No. Okay. It's still going to be <laughs> generic. What we do on that one is it's very topical. So like I'll be playing a video game, and with an expert, like a, a an expert, a gaming like professional, and okay. then I, I ask them during that stream questions about like big questions, like do you believe in God? Okay. And so That's they'll really like cool. we'll like pause the game. And I'll ask him like, "Hey, so what do you think about God's existence?" <laughs> and then, and then it's like random. Yeah, they, they're expecting it. I see. But this random like professional gamer is then they share their thoughts. What a wonderful idea! I gotta watch this. Yeah. Chubby Spider. Chubby Spider. Probably not These his are real name. Names? Yeah, that's the they name just, his mother gave him. Ch Chubby Spider. Chubby Spider. No question, just a virtual hug and a warm welcome to help restore him to for his continued journey ahead. Thank you. Which would be very lovely if it wasn't coming from a chubby spider. Uh, Matt says, congrats, Cameron Batuzzi, future patron saint of good hair. Oh, goodness. Question, any plans to publish your Bayesian, Bayesian analysis on the papacy? Uh, it'll probably be on some other channel where I, I mentioned in my announcement video that I won't be covering the Catholic Protestant debate on my channel. So if <gasps> someone maybe invites me to... Keep going. Sorry. If someone maybe invites me to come onto their channel to talk about it, I'd be open to that. All right, here's a good one. Anastasia says, is it possible to congratulate him in person in Rome? Yes. Can we invite everybody to come to this thing? We can't? Let's just do it. What's the worst that's going to happen? So, what time are we going? Seven? At seven o'clock, we are going to be at the Pope Paul VI residence on the rooftop, pounding limoncellos, sipping... Lemoncellos, and you are welcome to come and say hello to Cameron there at 7 p.m. Uh, Al Allen says, how do you make sense of bad popes or the possible oh. failures in the current pontificate? I think you've got to, again, kind of realize what the papacy actually means. And that's what Catholic apologists will often point out, is that like, it's about faith and morality. These infallible claims or statements are ex cathedra, and they're, they're, they concern faith and morality. And so if, if he's not operating under those specific circumstances, then you, you leave open room for error because that's only yeah. human, only natural. And so I think it really just, you've got to understand what the actual papal claims are. And most Protestants that are informed on the issues, well, they don't really use that as a, as a very good or strong objection to Catholicism. They'll, they'll, they'll point to uh, things like maybe justification or or the papacy saying that it's not found in history and so they don't they, they don't typically use the bad pope's objection although it is used it is used and some some people do what are you it. most looking forward to about becoming catholic hmm uh probably probably prayer and attending attending mass yeah Receiving Eucharist, huh? Receiving the Eucharist. Yeah. Um, okay, final question. Okay. If you want to discuss more, you can let me know. But Okay. Final question would be, there's a Protestant viewing, and he's just kind of at his wit's end. Mm. And as you say, different noetic structures aside, yeah. what sort of advice would you give to him or her? Follow the evidence wherever it leads. But just be open to it. Like, really be open to following the evidence. That's what, I, that's what I tried to do. I tried to be open while acknowledging my bias both ways. So I, again, I had bias toward Catholicism, but I also had very strong bias against it. And just, just do your best to follow the truth. 
I can't really give any. Yeah. It's very. It sounds cliche. It sounds like anyone can give that advice, but that's the best advice I can give. Is just really do your best to follow the truth and don't don't stop until you do it until you find it. You know, m- maybe the first step is acknowledging that you don't want to do that. Mm. Like to to act because I think most of us would say, yeah. of course we should follow the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're like. I don't want to do I'm not sure if I want to do that yeah. like what if it led to who knows where Islam Mormonism I, I am not so okay admit that mm-hmm. and of course you don't have to investigate every worldview and every religion but if you are feeling drawn towards Catholicism because of some mm-hmm. particular reason maybe admit I, I don't actually want to become Catholic and then say okay but at a deeper level don't you want the fullness of the truth well yes I do okay then what you said yeah, yeah. And and this is great. I think people should respect the heck out of you, Cameron, because even if they disagree with you, it feels like everybody always says, follow the evidence. And we're all good with it when it leads to our side. We're not good with it when it leads to somebody else's side. But to say, well, even if this person disagrees with me, you know, they're they're stepping out, they're, they're making a courageous decision that's not necessarily going to have a positive impact on their family or their ministry or their finances. And and yet you're doing that. So I I really commend you for that. It's been, been pretty tough. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, here's what I'd like to do. We have about 3,000 people watching right now, and I would like to ask those 3,000 people, plus anybody else who will watch later, to pray a Hail Mary with me for Cameron, his family, and ministry. And um, please go and subscribe to Capturing Christianity. Um, Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Uh, Become a local supporter of mine by clicking the link in the description so you can be part of the live chat that's going to take place in a couple of hours. And please consider supporting Cameron Batuzzi on uh, patreon.com slash Capturing Christianity or by donating to him maybe at a one time at uh, capturingchristianity.com slash donate. Donate, yeah. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's be good to our brother here. Matt, I feel like we should have said something at the beginning about your sunglasses. <laughs> You're not wearing these to look cool. Yeah. Or to like be. Th- that's just an accidental byproduct. It's an it acc- happened to be that I well, look cool. Well, you're like cool. your shirt is open. You're, you're like your chest hair. <laughs> I'm Italian. Out, I let like the you're... taco meat uh, flow. And you're. <laughs> uh... But it's, it's very. It's for practical reasons. <laughs> these aren't even a, your glasses. There is a sun, and there is a light brighter than the sun in my face right now that's correct so i'm glad we got that out of the way <laughs> I feel so like i should have mentioned that here's here's a test if you've watched all the way up until this point i would like you to say in the comments section your glasses look great or don't look great since i don't want you to lie and that will be evidence that you have watched up until this point and it'll also confuse everybody in the comments section who hasn't well maybe it won't because i had them on at the beginning anyway how do you feel about praying a hail mary with me i've never done it Oh, stop. I know. I, and I, this is terrific. What's funny is that I, I've, never, um, I've never done the rosary, but I've also had dreams about the rosary, about praying the rosary. I've had one specific dream where I remember praying the rosary in it, and I don't even know the rosary, but I don't know. That's just, beautiful. That yeah, and just a shout out again to Catholic Woodworker who sent this rosary. He wanted you to have it. It's really, isn't that beautiful? It is beautiful. It's really beautiful. There's a like link the... in the description. Click the link, 20, 20% off, and uh, check out his rosaries. They're beautiful, yeah. So do you, even, do you know the Hail Mary? No, I don't. I know the first line of it. Here, can we look it up and Hail, you can pray Hail with Mary, me? Hail Mary, full of grace. Do you are so terrific. <laughs> you said something the other day that was so adorable, and I mean that in the most patronizing way possible. Thanks. Um, we, you were like, can we pray? And I'm like, yeah. And you're like, okay. Uh, in the name of the Father. It was so awesome to hear you do that. And then at the end, you're like, do we, do we close that way as well? Ah, oh, dude. So, be- you know what it's like? It's like when someone comes to your home country and you see it with fresh eyes, through their eyes, you know? So seeing the beauty of Catholicism. All right, can you look up the Hail Mary prayer? Because oh, I don't have a... Your phone isn't working. Let's see. And we'll ask all 3,000 people to pray it with us. I think I may have got it now. No, I can't do it. Hey, if you type in Hail Mary. Should we just confirm him now, Father? <laughs> Who's your bishop? Uh, my bishop is named Francis. You are in the Diocese of the Vatican? We're right here in Rome. Okay. My bishop is Francis. Every Te- day text mass, your bishop. I pray for Francis. That's amazing. Text your bishop and ask him if we can have a... Did no, you no, 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 we're waiting. You know, I can't confirm him, but I can at least give him a priest's blessing. 
That would be beautiful. Okay, here it is. Here it is. Yep. All right. We'll pray a Hail it. Mary, and then Padre will give you uh, a blessing. So I'll pray the first half, and you pray the second half. Does that sound good? Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary. Holy. Holy. I've already messed up. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Let's invoke God's blessing upon you, right here with St. Peter's tomb behind us. We'll call on St. Peter's intercession as well. Heavenly Father, we call down your blessing upon your son, Cameron. We thank you for his many gifts. We thank you for inspiring this pursuit of truth because you are the author of all truth. You are the source of all goodness and beauty mm. and your splendid Basilica St. Peter's is but a pale reflection yes, of the glory to which all of us are called to experience surrounded by your saints forever. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, Cameron, and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Father. Thank you to everybody Thank who's you. watching. God bless you. Peace out. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, glory to Jesus Christ. This, this, it doesn't get better than this. You might think that it does. It doesn't. This is it. This, we've peaked. Right. <laughs> With human experience, like, it doesn't get better.